goodness, your love, your power, your strength in our lives. Keep us, Lord Jesus, in the hollow of your hand. Hold us close to you in these last days of this year, Jesus, and help us find a new relationship, a new depth, a new height. Help us find a new portion of you, Lord God, for we ask it in your precious and holy and mighty name. Thank you, Lord God, for your word today. Help us, Jesus, to get a vision of what you have for us and what you want us to do. In your precious, precious, precious name we ask it, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Well, we'll see what we can get today. Maybe not too much. But whatever we get will be good. Amen? It's all God's Word. Hallelujah. Let's... Be a little bit closer. Somebody fix it. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Hallelujah. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. A ver, ahora en español, espera. Todo. Toda. Hallelujah. All scripture, every little tiny bit of it, big bits and little bits. Hallelujah. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Hallelujah. So that means we need everything, every word, every period, every comma from Genesis to Revelation where it says, Amen. Amen. That's what we have need of. And we have need of that to be able to grow, to be able to uh, build within us a stature of the Lord Jesus Christ, given to us that we might be thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And if you go... Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In Ephesians, in Ephesians, uh, in Ephesians, I'm sorry. My head is like Teflon right now, okay? We'll, we'll probably jump all over the place today. Nothing, nothing sticking. <laughs> in, in, um, in Ephesians, it says that uh, we might grow up into the stature, the fullness of the stature of the Son of God, that we might be thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And that furnished in Ephesians means to be completely uh, with all of the, the furniture. With all of the furniture. And when I looked that up in, in Greek, I, I jumped and shouted. And, because we have a furniture. There's too much echo. Just put down where the, where the numbers are on the bottom. Just put T1. 
zero zero in, and it'll take the echo away. No, down on the bottom, where the, the lights are. No, on the bottom, one of these, down below, below, for the numbers, farther down. Okay, just marking zero zero. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Okay, now I feel normal. Normal as I can feel today. So we we need we need to be furnished. We need to have these pieces of furniture in us that represent aspects of Jesus Christ, of His person, of His ministry, of His of His um, the things that He has for us, the things that He's done for us, the things that He's gained for us. Each piece of furniture in the Mosaic Tabernacle has a reason that God put it there, and it's representing different uh, aspects and experiences in our Christian walk that He wants to place within us. And once we grow up to the measure of the stature of the fullness of God, then we, we, we're in the bride, but then the bride has to also grow. There's different, there's different levels within the bride. And uh, some, um, I was thinking of some preacher just recently, and um, thinking, you know, it's, it's so easy just to put God in a little box and say, this is all God is. This is all God has for me. Somebody was saying something like that on, on the radio or somewhere, and I thought, how short-sighted they are that God can only be this, that they can think of, that they can conceive, that they can, that they can hold in their, in their hearts or their minds. Because our God is bigger than the universes. He's bigger than any, any, any theory that man could ever dream up. He's bigger than anything within within this whole universe. I mean, this, everything came out of Him, so He's got to be bigger than everything like that. Every theory, every everything in physics that rules and reigns in the universe is out there. It's just just kindergarten math for our God, and for us to close Him up in a little box and just say this is all He can be, and that's all He has for me is just ridiculous. And so God has many many experiences for us, but the seven first big experiences and big steps in our life are laid out in the Mosaic Tabernacle. But after that, there's all eternity. We'll be growing, we'll be experiencing, we'll be learning, we'll be, we'll be understanding more and more and more in our, of our God, whether we make it to the new heavens or the new earth or the new city or the lake of... It doesn't matter where we're going in one of those four places. And I hope you all are going to the, to the new city. Hallelujah. In all of those places, there will still be learning. They will still be acquiring knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. The only difference is they'll never leave that place where they are assigned throughout all of eternity. Amen. Amen, amen. Amen, amen. And those of us that make it to the bride, we will have a privilege of going in and out. So will the kings on the new earth, but they'll have to leave. But we'll be living in the new city. And those that make it to the new city will be, have the privilege of ministering to the ones in the new heavens, in the new earth, and in the lake of fire. And besides that, in all of the universes, all over the place, God has many, many, many other universes, and he has many, 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 many other people. We're only one of the 99 that got lost. Okay? And so those of us that make it to the bride will be able to go to those other universes that never fell into sin, be able to go to all of those people that did fall in sin and tell them of the greatness of our God and the greatness of His mercy and His love and His power and just things that they've never ever dreamed of. And they'll, of course, have maybe some things to, to show us, but if we make it to the bride, we'll know more than them anyway because we'll have the omniscient mind of God within us and we'll be able to to explain many, many things out of this world of sin that they will never have experienced. And we can share those, that knowledge of God on that side of God that they will never, ever know. Because they will never know the grace of God like we know it. They will never know what forgiveness is because they never fell in sin. They won't know His love like we know it in the extent that we know it because we were sinners, we were lost, we were His enemy. And yet He searched for us. And they can never tell that. They, won't, they don't know what that is. They don't, they don't know what it is for the burden of sin to fall off your back when you, when you uh, receive Jesus Christ. They've never felt that. They know God is love. They feel His love, but they won't know it like we know it. 
and we'll be able to tell them all about that throughout all of eternity and share the beauty and the power and the glory of this God of ours to all of these people that have never, never, never experienced what the bride is experiencing and those that have made it to the bride in, the, in other dispensations of time, they'll be able to share many, many things. And so it's a great privilege to make it all the way up in this stature and be thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Hallelujah. Praise His mighty and holy name. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Yahovah, bendito, bendito, bendito. And the way to make it, the first three steps are blood, fire, and water. The blood of salvation, which has a whole world about the blood. And what I'm going to talk about today is about the blood, the fire, the Holy Ghost, the waters of baptism, and then the whole realm of word to help us grow. And then you reach the top, which is the, the, the head, the headship, the ark of the covenant where the bride is. And there you can find the relationship or the oneness that God wants us to have with his, with his son. And then we come back down to the bottom to start again here under the cross. Hallelujah. Under this altar here, hidden with Jesus Christ and the Father only. Nobody else. Nobody else. No friends, no family, nobody. Just God, the Lamb, and, and me. Martha says, me. That's good. That's good. Well, we're celebrating these days the birth of Jesus Christ. And uh, there's just one little principle I want to try and share. I'm not going to get very far on it today. Um, but it's a powerful, powerful, powerful principle that we've shared. And uh, I just want to share it in a different way. I even forgot my demonstration material, but we can make do if I even get that far. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. And it's such a... Um, such a deep lesson, I kind of wonder if I should give it today or not. But you can catch a little bit, okay? The little bit that I can give. Okay? Yeah. Here is God. And God had a son. And that son came down to earth. And went into the Virgin Mary. And one side of him was divine. One side of him was, was holy. One side of him was total, 100% God. But because he was born of Mary, what was Mary? Immortal, and she was also a sinner, and she was also human. Amen. So he also, because he came into the Virgin Mary, he also inherited a side of him that was 100% totally, completely human. And for this reason, he can be our mediator. Because it says in it says in Hebrews that he was, I think it was in, I think it's in Hebrews, it says that he is a high priest that was touched, can be touched by our our infirmities. He can be touched by our feelings. He can be touched by, by what we suffer and what we go through because he went through exactly that same thing. Hallelujah. And, and because of that, he can extend one hand towards God and he can extend the other hand towards man and he can be that mediator. He can be the one in between that makes the connection. He's like the electrical plug between the cord and the, and the, and the, the light company that, that plugs in and all of a sudden then everything is flowing. Everything is, is, um, is being charged. Hallelujah. And that's what Jesus Christ is. He is our mediator because he can touch me, a mortal, sinner, human. And he can also touch the holy, high, righteous, all-powerful, everlasting God at the same time. And he can stand in the middle and he can be, he can be that mediator. He can be that go-between. He can be the Holy One of Israel that, that can hear my needs and can 
can take them to God and can also know how to minister the things that his father, God the Father, sends back to me. He can, he can do that. He's a high priest that is, that is totally and completely surrendered to his father's will. And also he's totally and completely surrendered in one sense to minister to us, to help us make it to the new city. Hallelujah. And so when he came down into the Virgin Mary, he brought his father's blood. We've already studied that. We know that. He came down with the divine, invisible blood. If we have blood in our physical body, God has blood in himself. Where else did Jesus uh, talks about the blood of Christ in the Bible? Look it up in your concordance. It talks about the blood of Christ. They're invisible. They're immortal, yet they have blood. Amen? talks about the blood being spilt before the foundation of the world. There was blood back in eternity, invisible, that we can't see. So God has blood. Okay? Because nothing is in the visible that has not come from God, except, well, even sin is just righteousness going in reverse. So it's just been corrupted. Hallelujah. So he came down with that divine blood of the Father. But when he came into the Virgin Mary... He came into a mortal, sinner, human being that had mortal, sinner, human blood. So he also had, he not only had the divine blood, but he also had human blood. And this is one reason then that he could be our Savior. Amen? I'm just going to give you the principle. I'm not going to be able to give the whole the whole lesson. Let's go to Matthew chapter 1. Oh, yeah. Hallelujah. And if we can really grasp this, if I can at least give the the, the center of, of what what this is today I'll give you the I'll give you the the seed thought you can run with it and you can study it and you can expound on it and then another day we can expound on it when I have I'm more like normal okay and it says the book of the generations of Jesus Christ the son of David the son of Abraham what blood did Jesus inherit? Yeah. Blood of Abraham. Blood of Abraham. Blood of David. Let's just start there. Was Abraham, well, he's the father of faith, but was he a perfect, perfect man? Hmm. He was willing to let his wife be taken in, in, in adultery just to save his own skin. He was a powerful man of God. He did a lot of good things, but he had some he had some faults and failures. He was scared to death. He was scared to die. And he was willing to let Sarah be taken by Pharaoh and by another king in Canaan just to, to save his own skin so they wouldn't kill him. What about David? Was David a, a, such a righteous and powerful man? Mm -hmm. he was a murderer and he was an adulterer and this is the blood on the human side that Jesus Christ inherited All right. All right. renounce your wife fear for your life kill another man to take another man's wife and Jesus Christ inherited that blood in Mary hallelujah then it says, Abraham begot Isaac. What about Isaac? Let's just go pick up a few of these. How good was Isaac? Was he a very spiritual man? The word tells us a lot. He was a man of faith. He had a lot of good things. All of these men had good sides to them. That's why they're... They, finally overcame a lot of their problems and became the great heroes and the great patriot, uh, patriarchs that they, they became 
But um, Isaac, for example, was um, was somebody that his wife knew more of God, about God's will than he did. About the two the two twins, what were his two what were Jacob and Esau, and who did Isaac love? Esau. And what was God's will? Jacob was to be the leader. Jacob was to be the first one. Amen. And but Isaac was headstrong in his will that his firstborn, according to him, was to receive that birthright. Didn't matter what God told Rebecca. Didn't matter what anything had been said before. He was going to do his own will because this young man brought venison, brought food for him. The strong was, you know, the the, the manly warrior type, and he was the type that Isaac liked. And little Jacob was just a little old shepherd boy that didn't, you know, didn't sparkle or didn't shine or didn't make a big noise about anything. And so uh, Isaac also was outside of God's will in a lot of his life and a lot of his ways. And then it says, and Isaac begat Jacob. What about Jacob? <laughs> Jacob had a few wives. Some of it wasn't his fault. But was he a, was he a perfect man? Mm -hmm. But God told him how to do that. But Jacob had a few problems too. Mm -hmm. And um, and Jacob begot Judas and his brethren. Which would be Judah for us, not Judah. Judah? And what did Judah and the brethren do? Judah, Judah did a lot of things. <laughs> His, all of, all of, um, all of um, Jacob's brothers were something else. Judah, not Jacob's brothers, Jacob's sons were, were something else. But Judah ended up being the, the one that the, the lineage came through because the other, the other three failed. The first three failed in big time to fulfill their calling. So Judah became the one through which the seed came. This is the seed of, of the Messiah. Jesus Christ came down through all of these loins, okay? He came down through Abraham. He came down through through um, uh, Isaac and Jacob and Judah. So he was in the loins of all of these people and also battling in each one of those. But just to get an idea, Judah sold his brother into slavery. Yes or no? And Judah's the one that went with the harlot, which ended up being his daughter-in-law. And Judah had a lot, of, a lot, a lot of problems. He wasn't in some of the other things, but he had a lot of problems too. So all of these are different, have different sins in their life. You look at their life, you study their life. Thank God that God wrote the negative as well as the good so that we can see what Jesus Christ had to overcome. It says that he was tempted in all things. And in 30 years of life, it's not very possible that you be tempted of all things. Okay? So there has to be another way that in those short years that he was alive on the earth, that he could be tempted by all of the humanity, the sinful, mortal aspects that we have within us. And he could, in those, in those short years of his life, he could be tempted by all of these things. Okay? Then it goes on down, and Judas begat Pharisee and Sarah and Tamar, and Pharis begat Ezram and Ezram Aram, and Aram begat Aminadab, and Aminadab begat Nason, and Nason begat Salmon, and Salmon begat bowls of Rechab, Rechab, and bowls begat Obed of Ruth, and Obed begat Jesse, and Jesse begat David the king, and David the king begat Solomon of her that had been the wife of Urias. So here's another one we can add on, just to give you an idea. Then we got David down here, and then Solomon. What was Solomon's big problem? 
Uh -huh. He fell into great adultery and fornication and followed the gods of these strange women. Well, not strange, followed the strange gods of these women. He fell into idolatry. So each one of these, just these major ones here, and there's still a lot more there that we haven't read. Jesus Christ had to come down through all of those loins. Okay? And then he gets to Mary, and Mary has all of this in her blood. And he has to battle, and he has to fight, and he has to overcome all of this to become our Savior. There are many things. He, he, never, he never had to overcome murder, for example, in his own life, in his short life. But inside of him, this blood was flowing. Let me see if I can, if I can make it clear. Let's go to... Um, Go to Romans 8. Let's look at some Bible verses. Romans 8. Mm -hmm. Verse 2. Romans 8, verse 2. It says, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. Now this is deep, and I'm not going to get deep with you today. I'm just going to give it to you simple. And what you don't understand, just keep in your pocket and someday we'll study it when my brain can work a little bit better, okay? Amen? So Jesus was made, the Son of, the Son of God was made in the likeness of sinful flesh. Okay? And for sin, condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Amen? And it keeps going on down here. But he was made in the likeness of sinful flesh for sin, and he condemned that sin in the flesh. He had to come down and take on flesh. He had to come down and take on this human blood so that in the flesh... He could condemn it. He could overcome it. He could rule over it. He could, he could undo it and become our Savior and become our overcomer. Okay? And become the one. Now, when we get His blood, we get human, victorious, overcoming blood in Jesus Christ and we get the divine blood of the Christ that was inside of Him. Okay? So here, here is Jesus. Um, let me have... Two, two people real quick just to show you what's going to happen one for the divine and one for the human here's the Christ blood okay and here's um, the human blood okay and that both are inside of Jesus okay now, at some point in his life, adultery came up. Not adultery on the outside, but adultery inside of him, like we have it inside of us. Out of this blood of Mary, the, the, the adultery of David jumped up. Don't you like that woman? Look at that woman. Look what's going on over there. Hey, she's pretty. Look how she moves. Look how she talks. Wouldn't it be neat to go to bed with her? Boom, 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 boom. And the sin on the human side out of David starts tempting Jesus from the inside of Jesus. What is this blood going to do with that blood? What do you think it would do with it? Are we going to just let it keep going so Jesus falls into sin? What's it going to do? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Now Christ, here's Christ. 
eternal Christ inside of Jesus the man. Jesus the man is surrounding both of these, okay? He's human and he's divine. He has the Christ living inside of him and he has his own human soul and will and mind and just as a human being, just like we are. We have Jesus inside of us, don't we? But he's not us. But he influences us. Okay? And he's living here inside of us. Maybe I'm going too fast. <laughs> okay? So Jesus was the same. He was a human being. He was born of Mary. He was a human being with a body, a soul, a spirit, a heart, and a will just like we are. But inside of him was Christ. And Christ had the holy blood, the eternal overcoming blood, the all-powerful blood of God the Father. Okay? But because he inherited, he was, he was in he, from the womb on, he, he had this human blood inside of him. He had these human factors. He had this human, these human temptations flowing through him. Not that it, they were part of him. They, they, he was not sinful. He did not accept the sin. But they were there. And he had to overcome them. So that... So that he could be our savior. Because how can he know what it is to be tempted with adultery unless he's been tempted of adultery? Okay? So, so it's bouncing up and down. So is Christ just going to stand there and watch him sin? He's going to go over and he's going to take it away. And the, the Christ blood swallows up. The Christ blood swallows up the sinful adultery temptation. Not sin, but the temptation to sin that's jumping up and down in Jesus' life. And the, and the Christ blood reaches over and absorbs it and takes it up and destroys it Shia, hallelujah, and makes Jesus Christ then an overcomer of adultery at that moment. Is this clear? Is this clear? And then he walks on some more, and then up comes somebody else's temptation from these from this long list. We're going to study this list one day. It's on the it's on the it's on my list. To study the, all of these names and all of these sins that he had to fight coming down through the loins. That he had to fight coming down through all of the all of the sin, all of the all of the wickedness. Because in one short lifetime, he could not have suffered every sin that man, uh, every temptation in, in that short life. Because there's just too much. Okay? But inside of him, he had these things. He had to overcome them inside of himself. Can you understand this just a little bit? I, I know it's, it's deep, but it's going to help you all understand what Jesus Christ will do for you. Amen? Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Lord. And so he, he walks along a few days, and then something else comes up. One of his liar ancestors. Boom. Lie. Lie about it. Lie about it. Lie about it. And then all of a sudden, the Christ comes in and says, No, Jesus, that's not the way to do it. I'll take that sin away. And he wraps it up in the Christ's blood, and he puts it back behind God's back. And Jesus Christ is an overcomer over lies. Hallelujah. 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 And then the human blood of Jesus Christ is becoming more and more and more overcoming all-powerful blood. Because it's overcome two things now. His human blood. His human life. That he has chosen against these sins voluntarily, in flesh, in flesh, condemning sin in the flesh. Not in the spirit, not up in heaven. Not down in hell where many other things happen, but in his flesh while he walked upon earth before he went to the cross. He had to overcome all of these things. Hallelujah. And he chose against them and the Christ's blood then goes over and absorbs them and cleans them out and makes him a holy, holy Savior and makes that blood flowing within him. His human blood that redeems us now. That blood is being cleansed day by day by day as he walks, as he grows, as he matures in his ministry to become the Lamb of God to go to Calvary's cross. Hallelujah. 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 
Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Sweet Jesus, sweet Jesus. Hallelujah. All that they had before was animal blood. And animal blood could not get inside. Now, I want to make it real clear. He is only tempted by these things. He does not do these things. He was touched in all aspects, but without sin. It's okay to be tempted. We live in a world of temptation. The thing is to follow the temptation and fall into sin. So he had to be tempted in all. He had to be tested. He had to be tested in all aspects of everything that touches us and tempts us and makes us fall into sin. Okay? So in his flesh, in his flesh, before his death, as he walked through the multitudes, different things would, would come up inside of him. And the animal blood of the sacrifices was on the outside. That's why it says in Hebrews that that, that was not able to cleanse the conscience. We need a blood that can get inside of us. He needed a victory inside of himself over that human side and over that human blood that carried all of these seeds of wickedness that he inherited from Mary, his mother. And he started choosing and choosing from his childhood. You read, and it says that he grew in knowledge. He grew in grace. He grew, how? By overcoming these things that were coming up. To fight, to punch him back, to, to, to get angry, to steal, to, to keep a resentment, whatever it was. He, he overcame those all through life. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. And they weren't things from the outside. These were things that jumped up like in us. Lord. They come up on the inside. Hallelujah. It's not the devil out there that's doing it. It's us inside here that's doing it. And so God sent his son in the likeness of flesh. And he was tempted in his flesh so that he could overcome through the blood of Christ. Yeah. Hallelujah. He could overcome those things in his flesh and say, I overcame. On the day of judgment, there's not going to be any conversations going on. On the day of judgment, we're going to walk up before the throne of God and we're going to be judged. And if we at one point say, but I could not overcome. It was too big for me. It was too deep within me. Jesus Christ is going to come out and he's just going to stand there. And just the sight of him and knowing that he overcame that same temptation that I said I could not overcome is going to, is going to convict me. And then, I'll, of course, I'll either fall on my face or, or go to hell, whichever one of the, <laughs> whatever the case might be of whoever's standing before that throne. Because he overcame all. He overcame all. Just like us. He knows what it feels like to be tempted. He knows what he knows what that he knows that desperation. He knows but he did not give in to it. He overcame the temptation to give in to it. Yeah. Hallelujah. And you say, well, he had Christ's blood within him. Within him. He had an advantage. What do you have inside of you? Hallelujah. Christ's blood and 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 Christ's blood and the overcoming human blood. Jesus. We have a double portion. All he had was Christ. We have Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah! 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 There hath no temptation taken man. There hath no temptation come upon man. But God has given the escape, and that escape is through the blood of Jesus Christ. If we have Jesus Christ in our heart, we have more than enough to overcome anything, everything. All things. There's no excuse. There's no reason that we cannot be overcomers in these days. Because He had only Christ. We have Jesus Christ inside of us to take care of everything inside of us. There's no temptation. No temptation. No sin. No hardness. No, no wickedness. No darkness. No death that these bloods cannot take care of inside of me because I have Jesus Christ living inside of me. The Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. 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 
Lynn, blessed Jesus. And the only thing I have to do is apply it. The only thing I have to do, Jesus could have just said, well, yeah, you know, I guess I will lie. You know, it's pretty hard with these Pharisees around me, you know, living such a straight life. I'll go ahead and lie just a little bit. He could have done that, but he didn't. He chose the right way. He chose his father's way. He chose the truth. He, cho he chose the light. And we can do the same. And when we say we cannot overcome, it's because we do not want to overcome. Sister Hicks had a bunch of lessons a long time ago about that. You say, I can't, I can't overcome. You're really saying, I don't want to overcome. Okay? So it doesn't matter tiny sin or great big sin. We have, and it's not mentioned here, in, but there's, it's Lord Jesus Christ. And the Lord, Adonai, also has blood. Okay? Another Christ blood. Lord Jesus Christ. We've got three bloods within us to overcome these things that are inside of us. So there's no reason why we cannot make it. Hallelujah. And it's all because he came to be born of a virgin, came to take on humanity. He was born in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, uh, in a manger. God could have wiped out our sins some other way, if, if he could have, but he sent his son in the likeness of flesh to take on flesh, to be this Savior that could overcome these things in his flesh like we have to and to show us the way how we can overcome these things within us. And we have more than what he had, so why can't we overcome? Amen? And we have the blood inside of us. That's why he had to die. He had to get, the, get inside of us to free us. And there's two aspects to sin. The cause and the effect. Citrix talks a lot about cause and effect. The cause is inside and the effect is out, outside. And the effect is death and hell. And inside is this sin inside of me that lives. And when these things are jumping up and down inside of us, let's say Lupe was, is us now, and Luis is the double blood, and these things are jumping up and down inside of us, and we give in to it, then we get an effect out here, which is sin. And so he's got, the, he's got the cause inside of him, and out here's the effect, what I did what I physically did or said or thought, okay? And we say, oh, Lord, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me. Please take away my sin. Please, Lord, I feel so bad that I did it. I hurt somebody. And so the Lord comes over and takes away this and saves me from death and hell, okay? But we hang on to that inside of us because that feels good to be ever, ever able every now and then to get revenge, every now and then to get back every now and then to show people who we are. Okay? So we hold on to the cause and we only ask to be forgiven of the effect of that sin. Okay? Is this clear? We like to be, oh, I'm not judged anymore. Thank you, Jesus. But then the next occasion, boom, 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 boom. And, and he throws another effect out, another sin, verbal, physical, something. And it's, oh, Jesus, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me. And Jesus takes it away. And again and again and again. But why does he keep pumping them out? Uh-huh. He's never taken care of the cause inside. And that's what Jesus Christ came to take care of. Jesus Christ did not come on the outside. He could have died on the outside for our sins. But he did not do it that way. He took on flesh. He went into a body so that inside he could take care of the cause and the effect. He took care of the effect on Calvary, but he took care of the cause while he walked through life for 30 years, 33 and a half years. Hallelujah. So that there would be no reason for us to hold on to the cause anymore. We can get rid of these things within us just by asking Him into our hearts to deliver us from the cause. And not just get free from the, from the momentary peace of forgiveness. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and the sin. The blood of Jesus Christ washes us from all unrighteousness. Okay, you washed away in effect, but the cause is still inside. 
And what Jesus Christ wants of us in these days more than ever is to get rid of the cause, to get rid of this factory inside that keeps cranking out those little balls of sin day after day after day after day. And Jesus Christ came in flesh to be able to do that. Hallelujah. Let's go to Galatians 4. I'll start in verse 3. It said, Even so, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth His Son. And this means that His Son existed up in God's presence. It's the only way He could send Him forth. Made of a woman and made under the law to redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. Hallelujah. And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son, and if a son, then heir of God through.